Okay, we're recording. Everyone, it's Gordon Einstein, your local Dubai crypto and blockchain attorney, uh, continuing my series of conversations with people who are awesome. Uh, on that note, I'd like to introduce Greg Cuomo. Hopefully I'm saying this correctly, uh, from Stasis. I've known Greg for a while, and he has a very interesting project in Stasis, um, and he's agreed to speak to us at length about this, and he even has a presentation to present to us which shows that he's much more prepared than our average guest, which is fantastic. So, Greg, I know you're busy. I, I know it's just after the weekend. So th thank you for making the time and welcome on the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. So let, let's, I think, I think unlike the normal show, we're going to spend the majority of the time on stasis because you get that presentation. But just by way of context or background, so the audience kind of knows you a little bit. Where are you from? Where, where were you born? Originally, I'm from Moscow. Uh, I was born there. Uh, I studied there um, before I joined uh, a hedge fund, a global hedge fund, and worked almost 15 years uh, managing other people's money. Like a big my global macro hedge fund, proprietary nice. one to trade different derivatives, uh, complicated structured products, and some private equity companies uh, around the world. Interesting. And, and what did you study and where did you study? I studied math. Initially, I was a computer scientist and a programmer. Mm -hmm. I studied uh, different programming languages, um, physics, math. And then I decided I don't, I don't want to work as a programmer for a living after I created my uh, first company, which was an internet service provider. I coded everything from scratch myself, um, all, all the billing, accounting, firewalls, etc. It was a time when people accessed internet over modems, like a telephone lines. I remember. So I yeah, I created that company, had a lot of fun, and then decided I don't want to work as a programmer and went into finance. So, and that blend, uh, uh, software development, programming, math, and finance helped me identify uh, the uh, digital asset potential, uh, Bitcoin and other digital asset class. I thought it will be utilized from day one. I saw it uh, in 2013 uh, on my Bloomberg terminal when Bitcoin mm -hmm. first rose about a thousand dollars. In these uh, terminals, like this news headlines, there is a red line when something is extraordinary happens. Mm -hmm. So that was it, and that's how I learned about Bitcoin. That's amazing. Uh, can you say which hedge fund you were at back in the day? Uh, it, it's called SBD Global Fund uh, okay. and Everest Asset Management. Interesting. Okay. Uh, and then had you heard of Bitcoin before it popped above a thousand or had you paid attention to it? Maybe it's a better question. No, no. In, in fact, that's the thing. That's a uh, asymmetry of information, right? You only can learn about what you know, or at least you're aware of. And I was completely unaware Bitcoin existed. Although in 2008, uh, uh, I was quite deep researching the financial crisis, the roots and causes of it, uh, the, the way the bank misbehaved with uh, people's capital and uh, mm -hmm. money and uh, structured products and leverage. And uh, so that's why the, our marriage uh, together with digital assets was quite fast. Uh, it clicked immediately that this is the solution. Because before finding Bitcoin, I was trying to um, express my negative view on the global monetary uh, policy right mm -hmm. and and exorbitant rise of uh, money supply in different ways and few of them were uh, successful most of them were were not so i was trying shorting some assets which didn't go uh, down mm -hmm. and then um, and then yeah bitcoin nature really just turned out to be a perfect fit against this uh, global problem interesting and you make an interesting point you know as people looking for the future, once you know to pay attention to something, you can allocate attention to it. But you, you know, there's always that moment before you're aware of it, and and something unconsciously almost has to bring you to your awareness, and then your conscious process can take over and you can learn about it. I've I've been in this spot before. I think most people have with, with blockchain and Bitcoin. It's the question is like you, know, you need something to let you know when to pay attention to it. Uh, yeah, and, and what, right? So you need to know what, you need to know when, mm -hmm. um, particularly this time, or why this time is different, why this is the perfect uh, fit. Mm -hmm. So there is a variety of uh, features you need to re reflect upon. And uh, in my case, 
like I said, I guess I was uh, quite lucky to to approach this asset class uh, already educated enough to to understand the future. Yes, good good point. And so, how did you? There you are at the hedge fund. The red light flashes. Bitcoin's over a thousand. How what do you? How do you actually manage your pivot or transition? What happened then? Yeah, very good question. So so I started uh, trading it personally. Uh, mm -hmm. very small size, try to understand how the markets exchanges work, uh, figure out all of them are not regulated and have a huge credit risk embedded, which people don't understand. Mm -hmm. uh, MT Gox was a perfect example of that, how poorly it was managed, secured, um, uh, the assets that are worth now billions, right? And even then, they were worth significant amount of money, but the, the recklessness of the industry to create the infrastructure uh, for this uh, asset class was a total shock for me. Yeah. So it took me a while to, to pick a spot. Um, and I figured out that the thing that now we call stable coins is a perfect product for me to, to, to um, continue my uh, career and my journey in this industry. So I thought, mm -hmm. okay, this, uh, this asset class is here to stay. It will need a regulated and reliable foundation uh, what now is called on and off ramp and an instrument of um, trading, instrument of unit of account, right? Uh, unit of exchange, which has the same characteristics as the digital assets have. Yes. So then I saw Tether, which uh, the, in 2016, 17 was, right, uh, was um, really getting some assets and attention. I think it was 400 million back then in assets. And I thought, okay, so the world will definitely need a properly built, regulated stable coin. Uh, and that's what I will do. Okay. So the, the regulated part is interesting there. And how did you do? You, do you want to go into your presentation or do you, do you want to give a little background on Stasis? That, what, what, it's your show. How would you like to do this? Yeah, very quickly, I could uh, run some slides just to. Uh, get your audience an understanding how I thought about this industry in the first place. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, again, basically, uh, my, my background is uh, uh, math and uh, finance. Uh, is, first, is, is, uh, is this you as a Moscow student looking very suave with those glasses? Uh, well, more likely a hedge fund manager, yes. But that was, uh, I think, year 2018 or 17 when I quit the, the hedge fund, finally. I, I have to say, you guys love rocking the black turtlenecks. I see that a lot. <laughs> you, guys, you guys love rocking it, you know, along with the with the sports jacket. So good look. Okay, well done. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so so that uh, stable coin journey was quite, uh, quite a rough one. Um, so I first I brought in the auditor, then I brought in a central bank account, which we, helped us take off. Uh, and I'm in the process of getting this Mika license, which we will talk about later, which I think will be a cornerstone for the whole industry, for the whole world. But and, and uh, by the way, uh, just to be clear, you, you will explain what makes the stable coin stable. Of course. Okay. Of course. Super. Of course. But but generally, this is how I think about this technology, the blockchain, I mean. But, but I'm just saying, I never do on the shows, so put on my glasses so I can see what you're talking about. So it's not, maybe not the best look, but it's okay. Go, go ahead. Please, please. Yeah, basically, uh, society, humanity always needed an instrument to exchange among themselves, to trade, to uh, make investments, to save uh, some capital uh, instrument that is safe enough and sound enough for, for everyone to understand and use. Mm -hmm. And uh, over the course of centuries, people use different commodities, different instruments to express their uh, their capital, right? Uh, and uh, previously, all those experiments ended up with what we saw, what we now um, have as a banking system, right? Financial system. Mm -hmm. And it's not good enough because the technology finally allowed it uh, to, uh, allowed to compete with it. It's it's closed. It's uh, it's regulated, but it's still reckless to an extent. People don't know what the bank is doing with their money, right? Banks still face losses if they are. Uh, allocating that capital inappropriately or missing out the cycle. Mm -hmm. So the blockchain technology just allows to uh, 
disrupt clearing custody and settlement services, which I think are crucial and we face with, with them every day in our lives, mm -hmm. clearing custody and settlement. So just a really simple clearing is to know when somebody has something in form of capital, custody is to hold that and settlement is to make an exchange. A very basic example would be if you go to a, a grocery market, right? And, uh, or fruit market, right? You, you, you take your, a note out of your pocket so the seller knows you have some capital, some money, right? And then you take some, you know, a kilo, kilo of uh, tomatoes. Um, so you know the, the seller has uh, the product and then you exchange that product versus your uh, money. That's a uh, settlement, okay. right? And now you're in custody of that product. So what this technology offers is to really, really disintermediate to some extent and, and disrupt and compete with the centralized solutions to do clearing custody and settlement. Um, and uh, Mika is a really serious uh, uh, achievement in this space because it's the world's first regulation uh, really classifying stable coins. So Mika was created uh, to kill Libra. You know, remember there was this project by- I was at Libra's headquarters in Geneva. It was actually a PayPal yeah. headquarters. I did a whole presentation on this. Yeah. Exactly. So initial uh, initial Mika kind of request was to make sure Libra is not launched in Europe, mm -hmm. because again, if you think uh, Europe in terms of uh, uh, fintech and innovation, they're not very good at it. No. Unfortunately, all all the major brands and companies that operate in the internet and fintech markets are American, right? Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, mm -hmm. Google. Uh, I mean, you name it, Uber. All these guys, uh, they present in Europe, they operate in Europe, but uh, they are not European companies. No. So Europe was looking to protect its market from uh, Libra uh, product, Libra stablecoin, and that's how Mika was born. Now, it's not the best regulation, right? Uh, but as in finance, it's all relative. So currently, there's just no alternative for a major market for a huge economy to mm -hmm. classify what stablecoin is and how it can operate. What's more important is that the Mika allows the stablecoin issuer to connect to central bank directly. And that gives uh, significant investor protection, right? So okay. together with the claim on the issuer, so the, the product that Mika licensed entity will produce, a stablecoin, say, backed by euro. Actually, it can be backed by dollar as well, but it has to be registered in Europe. So that product is, so just think about, about it. First, it's a claim on the issuer, right? So as good as legal tender, mm -hmm. the claim on the issuer. And second, uh, it can connect to central bank account. So you've got a product that lives in the blockchain that's backed by real money, fiat money, and uh, um, is, is a claim on the issuer. So customer will always have an opportunity to buy or sell it against the issuer and is stored in central bank. So whatever happens with the issuer, the customer will always get 100% of their money back, not just the insured amount, not uh, the liquidated amount after months of liquidation, right? And uh, some re residual amount, um, mm -hmm. if, if no, say, in case of leverage financial institutions, if no government support, then the customers are losing their money, right? It's similar to Silicon Valley Bank or Credit Suisse uh, early on. So if it's... Uh, not the government or central bank to support or bail out these institutions, the customers would have lost money. And now finally you have a regulated solution to run a uh, block enabled uh, product, stable coin, and with the banking of uh, central bank uh, money. Uh, and I think it's quite significant because it's, uh, of course, well, of course it's still an experiment. So we still have, no, no, none of the companies have got the license yet. We're in the process of getting one, but we still yet to see how how it will unfold. But it opens up Sorry, portability. It, it, it remind me, is is Mika currently in? I forget. Is it currently enforced, or is it coming into enforcement? It's coming. It's coming this summer for stable coins and end of the year for service providers. Okay. And chances are, uh, if you trade, if you're a service provider and you and you trade against a customer and non uh, Mika licensed stable coin. Uh, you are conducting an illegal activity. So that means that every every stable coin that wants to uh, circulate 
uh, among European consumers, you'll have to uh, obtain a meter license. Okay. <clears throat> but for the pro for the products like ours, who has been in operation since 2018, uh, US, it's uh, the biggest non-dollar stablecoin around. It's uh, it's it's very beneficial because it can unlock 20 billion market for us overnight, right? Yes. So uh, so okay. three main three main uh, arguments why Mika is important. First, it's the only place in the world so far which has uh, its own financial system, right? Uh, banking infrastructure, mm -hmm. uh, and has this classification of stable coin into, um, into stable coin, basically. Because remember, six years ago, we didn't know that these are the stable coins. Three years ago, okay, we named them stable coins, but there is no such thing in the common law, right? Who knows what a stable coin? Qu courts don't know. <laughs> And Mika changes that. So finally, I mean, Do Kwan told us that. What is it, Luna or um, Luna and Terra? You mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, exactly. Super stable. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's an algorithmic stable, and I have a slide about that. Uh, we could talk briefly about it, but mm -hmm. yeah, basically, it's a it's a community uh, invented uh, concept, but mm -hmm. now it's making into public law in the common law in Europe. So in Europe, a stable coin will be a claim on the issuer, legal one. So courts will be will have to execute it if someone will fail to uh, buy or sell a stable so, coin. So maybe I'm anticipating where you're going with this, but there, there, there's it, it is more bank like in that it's a claim on a deposit by the issuer. Yes. Yep. Under this definition. And yes, and the deposit can be stored in a central bank, so it's it could be exempt from commercial bank risks to an extent. I don't want to go into the details how we'll have to safeguard our assets, but just uh, take it take it as a uh, as a fact that this is a much more reliable and sound uh, solution to create a product that we used in crypto to call a stable coin. Interesting. Okay. Passportability, which is also important. So it, it, it instantly unlocks all uh, 27 member states to, to buy and, and sell this instrument, right? It's yes. called passportability. This is a concept which was pioneered in Europe back in 1999 with EMI, electronic mm -hmm. money institutions, and later with broker dealers, where uh, regardless from which country you are from, you can face uh, another European um, financial institution and, and freely conduct business. So, uh, Legal uh, claim on the issuer, uh, passportability, and narrow banking concept, uh, which, like I said, is uh, ability to store, send, receive money through central bank infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, also, I think uh, it could boost the adoption of euro globally because uh, it opens up these borders, right? It creates uh, a link from anyone in the world to act, to use blockchain to trade more in euros, access euros, have literally a euro, say, checking account in, in uh, stable coin terms. Because right now- It's a very uh, interesting even, point. Yeah, right now, before, say, even blockchain technology was created, it was really hard, still hard to access euro account or euro currency in Dubai. I also have account in Dubai. I mean, to, to trade, say, even euro dollar with any local bank, you could face a 5% spread just because they they want to 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 control this sort of oligopoly, right, on, on their forex trade. And in, in DeFi now, you can trade the USDC to euro S at 10 basis points spread 24-7 without, uh, you know, weekends or bank holidays. And settlement is instant, custody is yours, right? So clearing is the instant as well. So you can always see what's the market depth of that DeFi uh, euro dollar pool is. So that, again, this technology together with this regulation unlocks the ability for unbanked uh, people for all countries outside of Europe also use uh, this currency as a product. And if but you actually, allow me to... Let me to... Because the... Mm -hmm. The political economy slash international angle of this is subtle, but really interesting. I, I feel like the U.S. government kind of raises an evil eyebrow at Tether, USDT, 
and isn't so happy about it. And I think their primary concerns are if you're saying that's existing outside of the of the regular banking system, and maybe is sort of anti money laundering resistant. So they've always they feel like tethers on a short leash, and the and the sort of the ground can be get pulled out of them from at any time. You're you're making a very interesting and subtle argument that by having Mika, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, and Euro-based stable coins are actually strengthening the, I was almost about to call it a national currency, the supra-national currency of the Euro. So it's kind of a competitive advantage to the Euro, maybe because the Euro is in second place, or at least, you know, people kind of compare it in their minds to, to the dollar. And I, it makes me wonder whether it's going to kind of blow back on the U.S. and force the U.S. to revisit stable coins. So maybe you can exactly. Comment. But this is how competition should work, right? It's mm -hmm. just in banking, in, in politics, to some extent, we forgot how it, it used to be, right? We forgot to have uh, a right to uh, express our interests, right? Express our desires. Yes. And we forgot. How, basically, this is why oligopoly is bad. Because when you have oligopoly or funny thing, and now in the world there is oligopoly in clearing custody and settlement, it just delays the uh, innovation, delays the integration of new products and services, worsens mm -hmm. the user experience for people globally, right? And just disregards their uh, desires and uh, 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 ability to experiment uh, with, uh, with new technology, because it's basically a huge barrier to, to entry. And I hope U.S. will do the right thing and create some crypto-friendly uh, stablecoin bill in the response to Mika. So companies like Circle and maybe even Tether could come uh, uh, and, and be regulated uh, finally. Because right now they're all in the gray area. You cannot onboard to Tether if you are individual. On, even if you are a corporate, you, you have a hard time onboarding to Tether buying or selling their product. I, 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 was, I, was, I just had this conversation. It's, yeah, you, it's you, you can uh, still on board to Circle as if you're corporate, but not as an individual. Circle closed that opportunity. If you are an individual person, you, you cannot have a direct relationship with the issuer and uh, buy or sell their product. Mm -hmm. Just think of uh, this concentration risk. Now around 80% of dollar stablecoin mm -hmm. transactions are settling through a United Texas Bank. And what if tomorrow uh, US decides to shut it down or, or, which is worse, declares this activity illegal? So suddenly you've got a problem. Uh, Tether has like, what, 100 billion in assets? Yep. Uh, Circle has another 40 billion. But how good are these assets if you cannot settle against your product? So, okay, Circle has money, but they won't be able to ship it to any of their customers because it, it will it, it'll be a legal transaction. Just imagine if that's the case. Okay, Tether has been accumulating some Bitcoin, right? So with some inner circle of their market makers, they'll be able to settle in Bitcoin. But what happens to other 97% of people? So that's why a claim on the issuer, a legal one, which you can enforce through the court system, Banking system mandatory is very important. And currently, the dollar stable coins lack that. It's just a, a good will of to try to send you a bank transaction. And it's it, it can become an illegal transaction in the US. I hope US doesn't do that mistake. And I hope there'll be some form of uh, stable coin bill, which will create some uh, requirement around uh, custody of these assets and, and uh, will legitimize these transactions. But right now, all of them are in the gray area. And, and, the, and the U.S. is not forward thinking with its regulation, unfortunately. It's very punitive in general. I, I'm actually kind of pleasantly surprised that Europe took the lead. And it's that's significant. I mean, it's yeah, a yeah. huge economy, huge population, huge geographical space, huge, hugely sophisticated. It, 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 it always seems strange to me that Europe doesn't perform a little bit better. Uh, but maybe maybe this is a way that they can. You, you yeah, know, exactly. and of course, I'm, I'm in Dubai and a lot of business, even between countries, even between, you know, raw material producers like oil sales is in USDT. It's yeah. kind of become the way to do it. 
because they yeah. because ever since the Russia Ukraine conflict and, and the restrictions on SWIFT, there's people are just they want to depoliticize their payments and they're yeah. nervous about using the dollar right now, whether they should be or not. Yeah, yeah. And unfortunately, most of these people don't understand the concept of a credit risk. They mm -hmm. play to an extent a musical chairs game. Uh, they think the music will continue to play and they'll find their chair. Uh, again, as a hedge fund uh, uh, asset allocator, I always maybe overpriced some credit risk, but uh, in a good sense, uh, that allowed me not to lose any material capital during the course of massive uh, market dislocations and uh, different credit events that happened alongside. So just very broadly speaking, look, uh, this is the setup uh, when a commercial bank account uh, is used, right? So you're only safeguarded up until 100,000 euro yes. in Europe and 250,000 in US, right? Uh, the CBDC, which I need to talk about really quickly here, is not a, a competitor, just uh, just a buzz, just disregard it. I mean, I suggest the whole crypto industry to forget about CBDC, it's non-event. Their limit per account is just 3,000 euro as, other, as proposed right now. And it will not be run on a public blockchain. Plus, I, I think the banking lobby will push this uh, limit even lower because uh, obviously it's a competition to the commercial bank deposit market, right? If uh, CBDC to show up with some uh, higher limits. So CBDC is just a replacement for metal coins, the ones you use to pay for a trolley in the grocery store or for parking, non-event. Uh, I, I guess, hey, Greg, I, I think, I think, I mean, just to be a little controversial, I, I think you're kind of hand waving the CBDC thing a little too casually. I, I think it's going to take time. I think it brings up a lot of issues like privacy and whether your currency is really your own of a CBDC. But I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be so sure that it's going to be a non-event. But look, uh, account limit three thousand. That means sure right now. But is that during no, a no, testing phase be before they increase it? No, no, they'll they'll decrease it. Uh, always, always, it always works like that. Initial limits, account, I mean, uh, structures, accounts, restrictions, they all go lower and not higher with time. So initial limit is 3,000. So that's what ECB is proposing. But uh, just you wait. Banking lobby will push it to somewhere uh, to three of 300. Uh, you, you and I have a beer bet. Yeah. We we can we can do that. May actually make it a whiskey bet. <laughs> okay, good. You know, I, let's, not, let's, I like you better. Raise. Yes, but I am yeah. a whiskey guy. You know that actually. Yeah. All right. So go, go ahead. I I just wanted to throw my cues out. So let's talk about the euro stable coin. Sure. So so it turns out that this is the most uh, uh, reliable and safe setup right now, and the legal one that can be in the whole world. So mm -hmm. you can have a commercial issuer, yes, which is regulated under Mika. Uh, it will have a central bank account, it will have some segregated deposits with commercial banks, and then it will have some uh, government bonds backing the issuance. But what's, again, I, I, I can't stop repeating this because it's very important. It will be a legal claim on the issuer. The assets will be very liquid, uh, safeguarded 100%. So the worst case, the whole concept of Mika is that in any worst case scenario, all customers get not 10%, not 100K, but 99.999% of their money back. Mm -hmm. That's that's the idea. Okay. Uh, and I don't like some of these requirements, to be honest with you completely, but again, in finance, it's all relative. So show me better regulation than this. And, well, uh, let's this. actually talk about this because it's a competitive world. Where does where can Mika be improved? Uh, so this summer, it's uh, becoming mandatory for the whole Euro uh, world, right? 27 member states. And uh, we have to, I guess, see how the enforcement will work. Because imagine some prosecutor in one of the 27 member states wakes up and says, hey, wait a minute. This is the exchange or this is the uh, digital asset trader that is in breach of this new law. Should I subpoena him? Should I kind of find him? What, sh what should I do? So... We have to see how the prosecutors will react, of course, and the court system uh, um, will follow on. But the law is there. That's the good part. The law is there. The central bank accounts are there. Some of the jurisdictions already enabled that. So Lithuania, for example, 
already has this connectivity. We have an account with Central Bank of Lithuania. Uh, now, to cast some light on the uh, roadmap for this uh, regulation, there is a directive called PSD3, and it will uh, require all central banks across Eurozone, so 27 central banks, will be required to facilitate such payment accounts for financial companies. Mm -hmm. So as a financial company, you'll be able to have an account with Central Bank of Germany, Central Bank of France, Central Bank of Portugal, and, and so on, if you want, uh, just to make and receive safe uh, payments without the uh, credit risk and the balance sheet of a big commercial uh, bank. And nice. this is how uh, it works right now for the Euro stablecoin. So you can onboard directly with us uh, and buy or sell any amount. Um, in fact, after FTX, we served literally as an ATM of Europe because we off ramp to some crazy non-crypto friendly banks and no bank so far has uh, uh, refused to accept money from us or, or to send to us, which is definitely not the case as you are aware in UAE, for example, or in some um, southern Italy or some Germany, right, where some banks are completely crypto unfriendly. And if you send and receive money from crypto exchanges, you get your account shut down in minutes, right? Actually, that's I, a good question. What, what is your legal form? What, what, what is Stasis? Right now, we are a Maltese uh, uh, company that has a status called VFA. That's uh, that that's the pre Mika regulation that was created um, in Malta back in 2018, mm -hmm. um, but it has some of the Mika uh, requirements. So Mika further strengthens the the requirements and provides passportability. But VFA had some of the requirements to name a few um, a third party audit, uh, mm -hmm. both financial one and the technical one. So we've got a technical audit of our platform, of our system, of our blockchain. Uh, uh, set up the way we handle hot and cold wallets and uh, that was a significant improvement over the say EMI electronic money institution space which nobody checked them for any technology they, they used right um, so... okay that's interesting and, and would you characterize yourself in any way as a is it a, a company or is it would you say it's are you uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna ask the question the right way but are you in any way a bank no, no, no. So we are not a bank. We are not allowed to call ourselves a bank. We cannot advertise any deposits or pay any yield. Mm -hmm. We are a, a financial institution that has um, a, a current a license out of the uh, Maltese authority and that we will be upgrading to the full passportable MICA license um, in the months to come. So that's actually we'll an be... interesting question. The, the, the term passport build, passportability implies that you have your home country license that can then be moved around. So is, is a license granted on a member state basis or is it an essential European authority that grants the license? So, yeah, very good question. Right now, we are not passportable. So right now, we cannot advertise ourselves outside of Malta. We only can uh, sorry, work with once customers. Once Mika kicks in, are you still yeah, once it? Mika kicks in, yeah, once Mika kicks in, we'll be able to post uh, a billboard in front of ECB or make ads in Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn. Because now, right now, Google, we, we cannot post any ad uh, anywhere, uh, but we will be able to, yes, because the, li we, the, the license, the Mika license, will get get us ability to reach out to any European consumer. Okay, now is it still going to be a Maltese license that got passported? Exactly, exactly. It still be be under Maltese uh, flag, Maltese regulator. Okay. And if we are classified as a significant stablecoin issuer, there, in the law there is a term called significant stablecoin. Mm -hmm. um, then we will be uh, regulated under EBA, which is a European banking authority out of France. And, and is that a dual jurisdiction? Or do you are no, 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 it will be not be dual, it will be basically a bank like regulator. Uh, nobody knows yet how it will work out because there are no significant stable coin issues so far, but that's how the law is worded. So, if you are classified as significant, mm -hmm. you are pulled out of your local uh, regulator and you are taken over by the uh, EBA uh, out of France. 
That's interesting. Okay, well, we'll all, I'm, I'm sure you will become significant, and then we'll do another whiskey bet. So, <laughs> okay, so go go ahead on the current slide or proceed. Yeah, basically, uh, this is how uh, a product should work. A stablecoin product should work. Anyone who is willing to um, buy or sell um, a form of money in the blockchain world should be able to have a easy to understand, uh, transparent, fast onboarding uh, with the issuer or uh, its partner and be able to stand and receive uh, this blockchain based stablecoin mm -hmm. uh, versus any amount of traditional payment he has, either bank card or bank transfer, SEPA, SWIFT. Actually, we, we support other currencies, Gordon. So I suggest you to try Dirhams if you want. You can yes. buy operate in Dirhams as well against the, the, the stable coin that we use. So the market potential here is enormous, as we discussed. So the dollar stable coin market is already 150 billion, mm -hmm. but it's the only uh, crypto use case that has been consistently growing all these seven years. So the number of wallets, number of transactions, uh, amount of transactions, total assets in the system, right? Number of counterparties accepting this. This is the so this has been the killer case of blockchain so far. Because why? That's true, actually. Because, because it disrupts clearing custody and settlement, right? That's that's the reason. That's the say fundamental correct way of saying it. Why this market has been growing like crazy and will continue to grow. So. So we've got two uh, market opportunities. I, I, I say you kind of left out the politically incorrect fourth one, which is it's a way to handle, get around, or manage capital controls, banking rails that are restrictive, the inability to get your own money. I mean, you're kind of implying that with the custody part, but I think there's, in my opinion, there's geopolitical drivers now also, which is... Mm -hmm. And, and which I don't way, really disagree with. I mean, I'm happy here in Dubai because you can move stuff around and do things. So yeah, there's... and 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 by the way, it's also much more AML friendly because it's much easier to see where funds are originating from through blockchain rather than through traditional banking system. Just imagine it's the year 2024, and we still use the printed bank statements to demonstrate that we have funds or we originated some funds. Yeah. But all these bank statements are so easily now can be drawn by AI if necessary. It's it's a joke, right? Yep. So uh, so the, the most reliable source of funds or information which can uh, legitimize or, or classify your funds as legitimate, right, is blockchain. You can, you can always tell, look, this is where I traded, this is where I originated some funds, this is how I made this money, or whatever, yield farmed, or uh, mm -hmm. just a crew accumulate make a made a positive PL or receive this payment from this supplier. This is the, the paperwork I have for that. So it's very easy to do um, the, the AML. This is why one of our four products is this on and off ramp feature, which we can face any customer, like I said, individual or corporate, and uh, accept money through traditional banking system and any currency other than the US dollar. We don't deal in US dollars, but any other currency is welcome. And we can uh, sell the euro stablecoin or vice versa. The uh, accept the euro stablecoin and uh, conduct the AML for, for the source of funds the customer originated. So you're saying, just to be clear, you do work with dirhams, but you don't work with yes, dollars. Yes. But yes. dirhams are three point six seven dollars. So maybe there's a maybe you can get a sort of backdoor exposure there. Uh, well, yeah, again, mostly it's used for some of the customers to, to do off ramps in UAE to the banks that are okay. accepting money from us, but are not accepting for crypto exchanges, because again, we are legitimate, uh, uh service got it, provider. Got it. beautiful so, point. Okay. Yeah. So we can, we, we can guarantee the bank that the funds that you originate are, are clear from, uh, AML risks. Right. And, uh. This is it. So we don't run a AD stable coin or we don't uh, do the AD dollar conversion that's on the client part. In fact, that's uh, one of the reasons Doc1 was uh, sentenced, right? Or uh, because conducted some transactions in the United States dollar through the dollar system, which now considered illegal, right? Or could be considered illegal going forward in the example of this USDT and USDC payments right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, everything you do in US dollar terms through the traditional banking system, you have to be really careful about 
because those transactions could be classified as as illicit transactions or illegal transactions. Um, so that that okay. that's the risk, and this is how uh, again Nika uh, helps helps products like ours uh, achieve um, much uh, uh, bigger markets because we we think I think it's quite rational and logical right now to at least to diversify. Why would you hold a, a product? Uh, in the dollar stable coin space, which you are not sure of, or which has these uh, huge risks inside of it, uh, is is not I, rational. I, I, it's it's and, a, good, uh, a good point. It's a scary point. Yeah, and and some of the interest rates confer, uh, in DeFi confirm that. So interest rate could be classified as a reverse CDS, reverse credit default swap. Say if you borrow at five percent. That means the risk of this product is around 5% per year, right? So just uh, if you monitor the, the, the interest rates for the dollar denominated products, you'll find some interesting, you'll come to some interesting conclusions that maybe there are some risks behind these products and uh, uh, I should at least think about them. Mm -hmm. So back to the market potential again, 150 billion is just the current dollar stable coin market. Or say the stable coin market because it consists 99% of out of dollars, right? And that stable coin market will continue to grow. So immediate chance here is to capture at least 10% uh, of that existing market. Mm -hmm. But longer term, there is a chance for euro to to replace or at least increase its share on the global settlement uh, um, market. And then the potential here is in uh, maybe in trillions of uh, euros of capitalization. And this is another interesting argument I wanted to make that every empire historically lasted around 100 years. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, I'm fully with you on the fact that Bitcoin could be one of the reserve currencies of the future. But chances are, on our watch, something will happen in the US. So the, the uh, recklessness of the government, I mean, you know this better, but you are from the US originally, and the, the way they mishandled their finances is just beyond ridiculous. I think it's no other happened. country, yeah, no other country managed to survive uh, doing like 10% of what US did in the last couple of decades or so. So the, comp the country is running triple deficits right now, so it's just a, a very, very bad situation. And I think next 10, 20 years, we will see some resolution out of it. So I would uh, yeah, carefully think about any USD exposure going forward. That, that, that was actually a bit optimistic, 10 to 20 years. <laughs> well, uh, again, hedge fund traders uh, usually say anything above, anything that's longer three years is unpredictable. Uh, but economist, because I'm also uh, have some uh, economical background uh, and research, I did a PhD on the global derivatives, the carbon derivatives. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, economist in, in myself just speaks that this is unsustainable. The point of economic, uh, the point of no return has passed, and mathematically and economically is just impossible to uh, to fix this locally. So some war has to happen or some merger maybe between Canada and Mexico and US. So some crazy scenarios. I mean, I, I, I can't uh, really tell what, what will be the outcome. I'm just saying, I, I, I'm thinking as this, the dollar and the US as a, as a risk of mm -hmm. it, and I'm just avoiding it and choosing something else. In Euro, at least the current account is positive. If you need to know one thing about Europe is that it sells to the world more than it buys. And that's well, just that's a recipe. Right. Yeah, that's a recipe that, uh, um, I mean, this this setup cannot uh, default, you know, the company cannot go broke uh, mm -hmm. if uh, it sells more than it buys. And even in the worst scenario of this rising input costs of energy costs, right? After the Russia, Russia crisis, the Europe still uh, managed to carve out a positive current account. Uh, reflecting a bit more uh, is that 10 years ago, remember they had the um, uh, crisis, the sovereign crisis, the budget crisis, Greece, uh, Portugal, Spain, Italy. <laughs> so some of these countries made a, a tremendous amount of work uh, balancing the budget. So Portugal, just think about it, Portugal almost balanced its budget. Wow. 
it, it, it was literally impossible on paper 10 years ago, but now it's almost balanced budget. So some austerity has taken place. So I think, again, relative. Are there problems? Yeah, for sure there are problems, but relative, it's just uh, a better currency for the medium term. Interesting. Uh, I need, I need All right, to... let's get back to you. I, I, I want to stay on stasis. I, I love the political stuff, believe me. Um, algorithmic stable coins. That, that yeah, elephant, algorithmic stable that, coins. That elephant looks uncomfortable. Yeah, exactly. And we are witnessing another experiment, um, the way where, say, sophisticated traders are just extorting capital from the public and uh, people who don't understand how basis trade and uh, finance works. Mm -hmm. But very simply put, you cannot back a low implied volatility asset with high implied volatility asset. Okay. Implied volatility is like gravity in finance. Gravity, you don't see it, but it exists, right? So if you drop something, mm -hmm. thing just falls. This is gravity. In finance, there is this thing called implied volatility. This is the perception of how much the asset should fluctuate going forward. Mm -hmm. how, much, how, how volatile, how the asset will uh, change in price going forward. It's the thing called implied volatility. And there is a market for it. The market uh, works through options, option mm -hmm. contracts. Um, and uh, basically, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's a basic concept that you cannot create a capital efficient uh, setup where a low implied volatility asset and stable coin is something that you imply to have very, very little volatility, right? And back with something that has potentially very high volatility. Um, no, so this no, is the me, reason... look, I'm a neophyte, but is it the case that diversity can, or diversification can address that issue? Is, is there any mathematical road from a basket of high volatility issues to low volatility when it's taken in the aggregate? Um, well, you can play around with some baskets and diversification, but in a sense, uh, it all comes to capital efficiency and some, some extra yield that people can extract to play this game of, of, of say, uh, no return, right? And until there is some extra yield mm -hmm. that is uh, excess yield that is paid for taking this extra risk, it can work. So, and with Terra Luna example, it worked until... It did not, right? Until I mean, the 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 train was not uh, didn't have enough steam to carry on and to compensate for all the stakers and the extra mm -hmm. yield they were demanding. So because hedge funds, okay, they play this game. They understand it's unsustainable, but they still play the game on the long side first, and then on the short side, right? When when uh, things start to go south. So unfortunately, this is. I mean, I'm, I'm a big believer in free markets, right? And in capitalism and democracy. But this is the example where, where regulation actually helps, where regulation helps to filter out uh, these experiments from public not to be burned and not to lose their capital trading those. Because small uh, guys, I mean, guys with smaller deposits or who, the guys who don't understand finance, uh, they 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 like the fact that they could get say risk free twenty percent yield. They don't understand the fact that it's actually not risk free, right? And it takes years and years of education and then market experience to at least start to price those risks uh, correctly, right? Yes. Or 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 reasonably. So I think. Uh, the only way to do a proper stable coin is to guarantee its uh, redeemability uh, as a legal status and to have full collateral 100% of the time, one-to-one, uh, -one, unlevered, without any derivatives or without any complicated instruments or counterparty risks, just one-to-one, -one, uh, preferably through, through central banking infrastructure, uh, but some government bonds will work. Uh, I think government bonds is the the riskiest assets you can put into the collateral of the stable coin. Anything beyond that is is reckless and is a recipe for a disaster. So you, you think government bonds are the riskiest or the least risky? No, no, the least riskiest. The least yes. riskiest. Because remember, stable coin issuer also has to make some profit, right? It's still a commercial operation, which yes. okay creates a product but anticipates to 
uh, make some profit out of it. And uh, when there is little risk, there is little reward, right? There is little sort of yield, yield, right? So the only instrument that is that has all these characteristics, low implied volatility, um, low counterparty risk, uh, high liquidity, are the government bonds, preferably of shorter duration. So this is actually how Mika also addresses the collateral requirements for, for the stable coin. It classifies uh, how, how, um, how much uh, could be Use how much of this reserve could be used to buy uh, government bonds, and what what are those bonds? Actually, it's an interesting question. If 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 you're placing funds on deposit with the European Central Bank to back up your currency, is that an interest bearing deposit? It's very good question. Now you caught me. <laughs> now you caught me because no, it's not, and this is why also I'm certain the CBDC limit will be much lower. Whenever we park with central bank, we get zero yield, like zero, nothing, no, nil. In fact, when interest rates were negative, we were charged. So when inter just imagine interest rates are negative, we deposit with the central bank, we are charged. When interest rates are positive, we are getting zero. And this is why- it Sounds like the France. Commercial well, uh, this is, yeah, this is basically the, the downside of, uh, of this regulation because it, 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 it's really hard to make money in a safe and reliable uh, collateral, right? Because obviously we'll have to buy some government bonds. Whatever we hold in central bank will be used just for uh, uh, the clearing, the, uh, the client uh, redemptions, uh, fast uh, transactions, just convenience. So, yeah, okay, I'm sorry, I'm missing something. When you issue a stable coin, do you need to have a one for one fully backed matching deposit with the central bank or is it kind of no, fractional no. reserve? Central bank is is just one of the accounts we could use to store the reserves. One Obviously, of. Obviously, one of, yeah. But it's very fast and efficient for payments to onboard and offboard customers, right? Because we, we transact directly through the central bank. But there, there's two ways of looking at it because you're, you're, either, you're either saying it's a convenient payment gateway, fine. Yeah. Or you're saying that your stable coins are so reliable because the money's on deposit with the central bank. But they're, they're, it's, that's different. Yeah, it's both. It's a payment and it's reliable. But for the yield, for the way to make money, we, we need to buy bonds on top of that. So around a third will hold in central bank just for the reliability and the convenience. Okay. A third, a third we will uh, buy government bonds with to make some yield out of it. Okay. Uh, and and the third uh, will we'll have to go to segregated deposits in commercial banks as per Mika. Interesting. Now the the bonds you buy, do they do they must they be euro denominated government bonds? Uh, there is a, like basically some uh, um, policy how we manage that, but it's government bonds denominated by euro in, in euro. Yeah, we could potentially do other currencies, uh, but it doesn't really worst uh, the risk or currency hedge. So mostly there'll be bonds of European governments. Uh, okay, Germany, and, and France, there's a, are, are like, can you do AAA rated if you guys have that commercial bonds? Is that a thing? Yes, yes, we can also do that, but uh, not at this uh, stage. We won't uh, invest into those. Initially, the plan is just to hold very liquid, just government bonds. Because this still the yield is is significant enough. Uh, even in this in, in this environment, this business model is is really profitable because the uh, yield on short term government bonds could be two or three percent. So we don't really need to allocate capital into more riskier stuff. I, I understand. I'm just trying to understand what, what's allowed under the rules, but I think I think you answered the question. All right, so let's go ahead. It's yeah, this is this is just uh, uh, the opportunity you can have with a stable coin in the DeFi. Mm -hmm. I'm not allowed to advertise any yields uh, because uh, for, for the reasons I mentioned above, but th there is a possibility to uh, uh, allocate this product, the stable coin in DeFi ecosystem and mm -hmm. also make some money out of it. So, I mean, I, I guess everyone has to do their own research, but uh, uh, there are some, there, there are some uh, very interesting, lucrative uh, money-making opportunities out there. And like I said, this is the new form of money. This is the technology that will disrupt clearing custody and settlement going forward. Mm -hmm. It's the same as 
uh, electricity disrupted candles or uh, cars disrupted horses uh, uh, or internet disrupted traditional media. So mm -hmm. the blockchain technology will disrupt clearing custody and settlement and the people will use this form of money more and more uh, with uh, every uh, every day in their transactions and cross-border settlements and payroll and treasury management and global settlements and uh, payouts, uh, currency conversions. Just think of the Forex market, for example. It's available 24 seven in DeFi, right? Yes. Uh, the transparent uh, um, uh, order books, guaranteed uh, settlements, right? In seconds uh, and uh, visible liquidity uh, without any bank holidays or uh, weekends. So with that, uh, I suggest uh, everyone to try our user experience, how fast and easy it is to get this product, buy or sell it. And uh, like I said, uh, they, they can use that QR code to download the app or bring someone uh, to sign up page? Yeah, yeah, just access our sign up page and get an account and, and buy or sell the stable coin direct from the issuer. Lovely. And we'll, we'll include that in the show notes. Of Perfect. course. Perfect. Interesting. You, this is, you've been working on this for a long time. Yes. I'm, I'm I've quite known committed. you for a while. <laughs> yes. I'm quite committed to, to this product because I think uh, the industry needs this. Mm. Uh, actually, everyone in the industry should think of uh, alternative to dollar stable coins because the industry may not survive or uh, will will be thrown back by multiple years if the dollar stable coin market falls apart it's a crucial component of the foundation of the system it mm -hmm. needs to to have a proper uh, product in place a low credit risk product which everyone can uh, rely on and build their uh, apps solutions uh, do experiments uh, make companies right startups in the space and so far the risk far exceeds um, uh, the, the, the market opportunity out there. And if, just imagine if this thing just unfolds improperly with the dollar settlements being impaired, you could risk some governments completely uh, restricting crypto or completely forbidding this. Uh, uh, I got it. I, I think about it every day. Yeah. Quick, I actually got to stop you because we're slightly over time, but this is amazing. And I want to thank you for your time and the, the fantastic presentation. And we're going to put all your contact information and all your show notes um, in the video. And we're going to share widely because I, re I really like what you're doing. I really like this idea. And I, I love that you're taking the regulated approach. So I, th I think I need to have you on again in like a year so I can know how everything progressed in this post Mika world, if you would agree. Yep. Yeah, sure. Let's pencil oh. that in. Together with our whiskey. Recording, was I care?